Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, it's a great honor to be here again, and also a great honor to follow a luminary in cardiology. Um, today, it's about 10 years since I first saw Dr. Brugada. I first recall um, I knew about the disease for about 20 years, so, but when I was going to listen to him for the first time, I made sure that I was in the front. And um, at the end of the lecture, I made sure that I get his signature. So it's about July 2005. And uh, so it's a great honor to follow him today. Um, he was so graceful, he said, of course. I still recall that, and signed on my book. So the topic assigned to me was um, ventricular ectopic, what every physician needs to know. Uh, this is a common topic. That's why I chose this uh, electrophysiology being subspecialized and, and to relate a topic that can be related to everybody. Um, not what everything we need to know, but what sort of in general sense what we need to know, and I try to be as updated as possible. So premature ventricular contractions or premature ventricular complexes are generally recognized uh, being a broad complex, uh, QRS complexes with a duration greater than 120 milliseconds. And some key features, like they have a bizarre morphology, and usually the T wave is in the opposite direction of the QRS, and uh, uh, there is a, what we call a compensatory pause, and also sometimes we recognize what we call a retrograde P wave, that's the QRS that's conducted in the opposite direction to the atrium, and these features might help you to, to recognize the PVCs. And uh, the nomenclature has been all over the place. Uh, PVC is the term that I'm going to use for this lecture, stands for premature ventricular contractions or ventricular complexes, but then other people, they reverse it, they call it VPC, ventricular premature complexes, or VPD, ventricular premature depolarizations, or VES, ventricular extrasystole, and so on. But I'll use the term PVC, which seems to be the more common term used today. Um, Classification of PVCs, just is to all of us using the same language. If it's a one beat, we call it an isolated PVC. And if they, it's two beats come in a row, it's a pair or a couplet, which you can see on this um, halter monitor. And, uh, um, and if it's three beats, but at a rate of less than 100 beats per minute, it's continuous, um, it's, uh, we call it idioventricular rhythm. Uh, if three PVCs come in a row, it's a non-sustained VT, but usually we have upper limit of 30 seconds. So anything uh, greater than 100 beats per minute and more than three beats but less than 30 seconds is non-sustained VT. And if a PVC follows every normal beat, we call it a ventricular bigemini. If a PVC follows every second normal uh, beat, it's a, it's a trigemini and then a quadrigemini and the pentagemini and so on. You can keep naming them. This is just to have a common nomenclature. And what's the anatomy and physiology? Well, PVCs by nature arise below or uh, distal to the His bundle. So in, in um, um, the conduction system, starting from sinus node through the atrium to the His bundle and to the AV node, I'm sorry, AV node to the His bundle, but then below the His bundle, anything below. So it could be the right bundle or the left bundle or any, any of the fascicles or Purkinje uh, fibers or from the ventricular myocardium, right ventricle or left ventricle. Or could be even you go back, so you follow the flow out in the outflow area. So right ventricle outflow tract, left ventricle outflow tract, and as far as the muscle fibers go even beyond, you may find ventricular ectopic coming from pulmonary artery or in the aorta or sinuses of uh, salva region. So the physiology is interesting because that's what you see in real life. Uh, when you have a patient with PVCs frequently, uh, most often uh, somebody recognizes bradycardia. And that's because, as you see in this slide, uh, the, the dotted arrow indicates there is no pulse there, although there is a heartbeat, because the premature contraction comes early and probably the, the ventricle doesn't have much time to fill in. So it doesn't create a pulse, but it creates an electrical impulse. So there is a sort of electromechanical dissociation. And it sort of gives a, um, although there is no bradycardia by ECG, 
but there is a relative bradycardia by clinical examination. And if you look into the second dotted line, there is a small pulse. And so there you get a 3D pulse. And the interesting other physiologic parameter here is if you see the beat that follows the PVC, now you have a long compensatory pause, the beat follows the PVC, now has a longer time to fill in. And by doing so now, the, here the pressure scale is 200, you might not appreciate it much. All, even though the patient may have normal heart, you may have a little stronger heartbeat because the heart has filled in a little more, this, uh, this classical starling effect. And the patient feels the post-PVC beat. So interestingly, the skip beat is the PVC, but the patient feels as a skip beat is the post-PVC because that's what comes with the thump. And so that's the physiology. And uh, the compensatory pause uh, is uh, it's an interesting term. I don't know why it's a compensation there. But um, it's basically uh, the, when a PVC conducts northwards or retrograde direction, it inhibits the sinus node. So if the sinus node doesn't fire, it delays so the next sinus beat. And then thereby there is a compensation, and that's one of the features that might help you to recognize, particularly in association with the retrograde P. Um, the evaluation of PVC, there's not much written. Now, here I am resorting my talk only to PVCs, not about non-sustained or sustained VT. So within that framework, there's not much written, although I, 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 evaluate, I look into the European Heart Rhythm Association and the Heart Rhythm Society and Asia-Pacific Heart Rhythm Society guidelines, um, where they allocate a couple of pages about PVC management uh, pretty broadly. But this was published about a year ago. But you know, interestingly, there's very interesting data that came out even as of last month. So if somebody wants to look into uh, some, get some guidelines, a couple of pages in this uh, document will be useful. So I think the next three slides are the most important in the general sense. Uh, because when you have a patient in front, what you are looking into is how you evaluate. What's the sort of a framework? What's the thinking pattern that we need to have? And this is the background that we all know. All of us in this room, I think 80% of us have some PVCs at some time. And um, it's so it doesn't mean we need to be treated, everybody, because there won't be enough cardiologists to treat, or not even doctors. because then. So the PVCs are so common. And depending on the population you look at, even in the general population, it's very, you know, there is a high, high proportion. And in patients with or without structural heart disease, it's common. The interesting thing is some patients may be asymptomatic even with a very high burden of PVCs. So the first person to get alarmed is the doctor, not the patient. Because with the regular pulse or getting an EKG, the doctor panics, but the patient doesn't even know he or she has it. Uh, the, on the other hand, the others may be quite symptomatic even with few PVCs. So there's a huge variation. But the reality, as we all know, the PVCs are most often benign and just requires only reassurance, most often, an absolute majority of cases. But it behoves careful uh, evaluation prior to providing reassurance. So, so what do we need to know? So these are the things we need to think about. Now, there is an algorithm in the guidelines, but I don't want to go through algorithms. I just go through what I, or generally what we do. First of all, to get a, take a step back and see what's the context in which these PVCs occur. So get into the history. Do the, does the patient have symptoms, or is this an incidental finding? You know, that, because it's, it's, it's what matters to the patient first. And then, see in the history or with subsequent testing, do these PVCs occur with exercise, or during, or recovery? Or in the history, is there you know, any suggestion of ischemic heart disease, structural heart disease, or sort of channelopathy? And, and also the family history of syncope of, or sudden death. So that's the context. And then, now you have PVCs. Are there any clues to suggest they are quote unquote malignant? Well, you take ECG, ideally 12 lead, and look at the QRS morphology. If the QRS morphology is suggestive of it's coming from like an outflow tract region, uh, they are generally benign. If the morphology is polymorphic, not a you know, monomorphic, think of maybe something is going on, maybe it's ischemia, maybe electrolyte. You know, that's a sort of a clue. Doesn't need to be always, and there are no hard and fast rules here. 
if the PVC is short coupled, which means the PVC comes very close to the preceding QRS complex, there's a risk of R on T. Now, this is a very rare scenario, and that's what makes us nervous most often, but, but then that's something you need to think about. So that's, uh, those are the clues help you to differentiate benign versus malignant. And then you can take a halt amount to do, get at a burden. Now, the burden of PVCs is usually referred to as percentage of PVCs per 24 hours. On an average, adult human being has about 100, 120,000 heartbeats per day, and out of which, uh, what's the percentage of PVCs? And then, if you want to go on further, depending on the patient, might order a stress test to see whether the PVCs do uh, occur or they, do they dissipate or just augment during exercise or after. So additional uh, clues. And then you can expand. I mean, there's no limit to that, but, you know, so whether you go on a cardiac imaging, a cause, and so on, but I just want to give you an idea based upon the initial idea. So once you have that, the decision-making is based upon, is this really an incidental finding like the, the top figure here, just you have a few PVCs on a monitor, or is it a cause of symptoms? And then you have to think of the patient and, and, and you know, address that issue with the symptoms. Now, what are the symptoms? Well, palpitations, common, some call it dizziness, you know, some cause fatigue. And rarely, uh, people might feel something in the neck or something like a dysphagia. Very rarely, syncope by itself, unless it triggers an arrhythmia, just you have a bigeminal PVCs, they hardly cause syncope. But, but, but if, if it triggers an arrhythmia, it might cause that. Um, and... And, and, and more so, the worst case scenario, is this the risk marker of something bad to happen? Most often, that's what we think of. The PVCs themselves, we don't care much about it, but does this mean something? Does it cause VT or cardiomyopathy or heart failure or death? And that's what worries people or the doctors as well. So we have to look into that kind of thinking and make the decisions accordingly. So let's illustrate some facts through patients. Uh, patient number one is a 42-year-old woman with no previous di uh, heart disease and, and presented with recurrent palpitations, exertional fatigue, and dizziness. And there was a halter that revealed out of 119,000 beats, 43% were PVCs, as highlighted in the, uh, the top red box. And, and this is a sample of halter, which I think most of you have seen this. And that alarms... You see here it's in bigemini, sometimes trigemini. 43% is quite high. She sort of close to my top record of the number of PVCs here. So, and by looking at these PVCs, so we have an idea of percentage, but where do they come from? And the 12 EDCG is absolutely useful. And, and try to capture PVCs in all 12 leads. And if you are in question, refer to an electrophysiologist and, and get an opinion because they can tell you exactly where they come from. Now, I'm not going into discuss how to localize the PVC from the 12 EDKG. It's a very interesting, fascinating topic, can take a long time. But suffice to say, in this case, this comes from the, the, the right ventricular outflow tract region. And, and you can see in the inferior leads, it's going downwards from top to bottom. And, and lead V1 has a left bundle branch block pattern with little uh, the transition between V2 and V3, but regardless, so it's come from the outflow tract region, which is by far, by far, the commonest area of PVCs. In, in. And I do recall uh, Dr. Dunilo saying when he first started here, I think he saw a plethora of right ventricular PVCs so much that he started wondering whether it's an Asian disease. And I think this is a by far the common. So, so commonest area that you see PVCs, commonly from the right ventricular outflow tract, but also in the anatomy, you can see the, the right and the left ventricle outflow tracts, they are sort of a going across with each other, so like this, like this. So you can imagine that anatomically, the whole region um, is, uh, if I can make that, I'm sorry, the uh, pointer. So here, the, uh, the, the, right, the right ventricle outflow tract, and immediately behind it you have the left ventricle outflow tract, and even towards the mitral annulus. The whole area uh, you know, is a region where you see a high proportion of PVCs, and the mechanisms seem to be like a sort of a triggered activity. It has nothing to do with coronary artery disease, nothing to do with any ischemia or scar. So that's a woman with high burden of PVCs. Now the decision-making, what to do about that, will be discussed later.
How about another case scenario? A 57-year-old woman, no uh, previous history of heart disease, evaluated for dyspnea on exertion, and has a low EF. She was ruled out for coronary artery disease, and there was no other reason I mean, we couldn't find. And Halter monitor revealed 28% of PVCs. But the patient told me that when she was pregnant during routine checkups, some doctor found irregular pulse. So that was uh, more than 20 years ago. So her low EF and has a high burden of PVCs. And we know today there is an entity called PVC-induced cardiomyopathy. And that raises a suspicion, could this cardiomyopathy be related to PVCs? And, and the mechanism for this is less clear. You can speculate. It could be that if you have a left bundle PVC, that causes left ventricular dyssynchrony, and this dyssynchrony goes on for a long period of time, may cause cardiomyopathy, or might cause some sort of oxygen demand. Or maybe, you know, the, normally the heart left ventricle, uh, ventricles activate sort of a from apex onwards squeeze the heart, but the PVC arises from a different area, so the, the normal physiological left ventricle activation is disrupted. I, we don't know what the cause is, but we know that uh, frequency of PVCs is related to the development of cardiomyopathy over a longer period of time, it's not in a week or a month or a year, longer period of time. And the initial in, uh, idea for, of this came from actually the electrophysiology laboratories because there were many patients in whom PVC ablation resulted in subsequent improvement of ejection fraction. So what's the exact burden of PVCs you need to have or you need to worry about to, to, for the uh, develop, development of cardiomyopathy? And that's a little tricky one. Now, the study by Bamman in 2010 said that if your PVC burden is greater than 24%, you are at a high risk. Your chance of having a PVC-induced cardiomyopathy is high. However, even in the guidelines, they state, based upon the studies, that even as low as 10% in some people, you get this. So if you have a high bar, the specificity of finding is very high. But, but when, the, when it's low, about 10%, you have to keep that in mind. But if it's below 10%, you don't have to worry so much. But this worry factor is not immediate. As I said, this development occurs over many, many years. And this study probably will be a landmark study by Dukes, which was published this month. And I was lucky to grab this on my way down here. This is a population-based study, just like elderly men. And they found that if you take PVC count and you divide them into quartile ranks, the higher the PVC burden, the greater the chance down the road you develop cardiomyopathy and you have a higher risk of mortality. This is done in a multivariate analysis. And so, in fact, they found that the PVC burden is as important as BMI, hypertension, and so on, the risk factors for the de development of cardiomyopathy. So I think the data is gradually getting solidified about this PVC-induced cardiomyopathy. But remember, this is not tachycardia-mediated. Tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy is related to rapid heart rate. This is not necessarily the same mechanism. And also, this study revealed, if somebody is interested, I refer to the Journal of American College of Cardiology this month, uh, that the PVC burden is related to the development of um, congestive heart failure. So the question that we have when you have a patient with PVCs in front with a low EF, is the PVC cause low EF or the low, low EF cause the PVCs? And that's a difficult thing to establish. So you had to look into some clinical judgment here. If the patient has a long-standing history of PVCs, like my patient, if you're lucky to find that information, maybe they are more related, one cause the other. If it's a monomorphic, high burden of PVCs, probably the PVCs cause cardiomyopathy rather than cardiomyopathy is causing PVCs. If you have polymorphic PVCs, maybe there's something else. Maybe the patient has structural heart disease. And if the echocardiogram shows more global, then probably it's a general process like PVCs. But if there are signs of focal or regional or segmental wall motion abnormalities, it probably there is a scar or some other process rather than leading to PVCs. And obviously, you have to rule out coronary artery disease. And if you have access to MRI scan and so on, to rule out other structural heart uh, disease causes. And finally, by treatment, either by ablation or with a prolonged antiarrhythmic therapy, if you prove that the ejection fraction improves, then you clinch the diagnosis. So 
So another clinical scenario related to PVC is patient number three, 65 year old man with a history of coronary artery disease and myocardial infarction and chronic kidney disease. And once he got admitted with uh, chest pain and recurrent angina, and he came with this PV, uh, this EKG, uh, you see um, sinus tachycardia and a trigeminal broad complex uh, outflow tract looking PVCs. And then it doesn't take two, three hours. The nurse calls you and the patient has this. And uh, so what you find is the, that ventricular and unsustained tachycardia in this scenario is similar to the PVCs, or the PVCs trigger ventricular tachycardia. So what do you do about this? Now, this is, we do a lot of, oh, I mean, this is what we do often. You have to look into that. It's another reason. Is this ischemia triggering this scenario? Or is a heart failure? Or there's electrolyte imbalance? Or is the patient septic or thyroid? Or is there you know, some other scenario triggering this? Because in a scenario like that, you rather look into secondary causes because the gentleman probably had PVCs for a long period of time. Why this is triggering VT now? Very seldom you had to look into PVCs as an isolated problem in this scenario as a primary arrhythmia. Or, but if you identify PV, a single PVC always as a constant trigger for VT or VF, then you can chase that PVC. So those are the scenarios I broadly exp um, explained, PVC-related, being asymptomatic or causing symptoms or causing LV dysfunction or causing ventricular tachycardia. So we know that PVCs in the setting of myocardial infarction patients, they are associated with some bad outcome. This is about 40 years ago. But we also know that treatment of PVCs in the setting of myocardial infarction, particularly with flaconide type of drugs, enconide and morisicine, is detrimental. You, and this is that landmark CAS trial that all of us should know uh, as uh, practitioners of evidence-based medicine that showed that although the PVCs were, PVCs were associated with increased mortality in post-MI patients, treatment of PVCs with class 1C agents is not um, um, uh, appropriate because it increases the mortality. Or maybe the, the, so the theory didn't hold suppression of PVCs would improve uh, mortality, but the problem may be in the drugs um, and rather than the, the theory itself. So can you use different drugs? I mean, obviously, you have to in certain cases. Uh, we use amiodarone quite frequently in this setting if the patient has, uh, uh, um, because amiodarone tend to, hopefully, I mean, we have a patient having multiple VT and so on, we have to do that. Can you use ablation? Well, in selected centers, particularly well, well experienced centers, they have tried ablation in very selected situations, but it's not the, the mainstream. So, in a broad sense, if you decide to treat the PVCs for the reasons of symptoms, for the reasons of cardiomyopathy, or for the reasons of avoiding ventricular tachycardia, for those three reasons, if you decide, the options are this. I mean, you can talk about avoiding caffeine, alcohol, all that, but I mean, it, it doesn't work in reality uh, for the most part. But in terms of interventional or the medical therapy, beta blockers are commonly used. Non-dihydropyridine -di um, calcium channel blockers like verapamil commonly used, sometimes diltiazem. And then antiarrhythmics commonly used are amiodarone, and you have to weigh these things, you know, individual patient. Um, and other antiarrhythmics can be used, for example, for the right ventricle outflow tract PVCs. Um, you can carefully use flaconide and, and propafinone like drugs if you have it available. And the last resort is also catheter ablation, and you need to, you know, refer the patient to an electrophysiologist to make that call. Now, um, the Catheter ablation had been performed in all types of PVCs. Uh, now, this is uh, a study from uh, the group um, um, uh, of Dr. Natali. Um, my subsequent speaker, Dr. Lacuretti, belonged to this group earlier. And one of his uh, um, co-fellows wrote this article several years ago, the patient with ischemic cardiomyopathy. Like that patient I described, my third patient in that setting, they go and chase the PVCs and ablate. And that saved the patient from recurrent VF because the patient has an individual PVC. Um, this is uh, a study from both the U uh, US and Europe. 
idiopathic PVC ablation for the prevention of ventricular fibrillation. So, but these are highly, highly specialized centers using uh, their skills to target certain PVCs to, to prevent adverse outcome. This is not mainstream, but can be considered in individual patients. Uh, the multi-center uh, 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 multi outcome for the catheter ablation for idiopathic PVCs came out just a couple of months ago. Even it shows that in setting the ablation can be, can be used. Um, if somebody wants to know what kind of a, um, patients are more appropriate for ablation, I refer you to this excellent article um, in the Journal of Atrial Fibrillation, and I'm pleased to say that my my subsequent uh, speaker is the chief editor of this, and um, I found it very useful. And, and I can, if any of you are interested, I know you can talk to me afterwards about this. So I'm ending my talk with a case, I thought, just to highlight. Um, I had this gentleman whom I call constantly dizzy. This is a gentleman with a premature coronary artery disease. He was in his 40s, had his first MI in his late 20s. Ejection fraction was barely 20% or 30% had a defibrillator implanted already, but the man never could stand properly. He's always dizzy. He never passes out. And he came to the cat lab, and they gave me this tracing. What he has is, you see the top part, uh, he has a sinus beat in the left top corner followed by a run of polymorphic VT, another sinus beat, a polymorphic sort of VT, and another sinus beat. So, and in the cat lab, you can look at the blood pressure tracings, he is on ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, all these things. So his blood pressure, systolic is barely 90. But with the PVCs, his blood pressure drops to about 40. Not enough to make him faint, but to dizzy. And then with the next sinus beat, it goes up, and subsequently it goes down. So he was almost suicidal because his life was so poor. And, uh, and the drugs didn't work. So it, he was like this. And so what we found was interesting. When you look at this anal uh, the, the, uh, the tracing, what you find is you have a sinus beat, and you have PVC, and you have non-sustained VT. And there's sinus beat, a PVC, and a non-sustained VT. And the PVC is the same. And I think I, know I probably showed this slide before, too. But when we see the same PVC, it raises a flame in electrophysiologists, because you can chase that PVC. And so. You can, and this particular PVC came from um, the, uh, the uh, sort of a mid-left ventricle, uh, probably related to one of his previous scars. And uh, we tried to ablate him once. Didn't work. And the man was nearly suicidal with his quality of life. So the family pleaded for the second ablation. And second time, we were lucky. So his ECG, I don't know whether you can see, got cleaned. And I didn't have to sleep for three days when you get that. So this is not a VT by itself. But again, anecdotally, you can do with ab ablations. I, I, that's the point I'm going to raise. Uh, so the, the treatment options are, are wide. Most often, you don't have to do anything reassurance. But if you think a patient has a risk of cardiomyopathy, let's say you have a patient with a lot of PVCs, then you are bound to follow these patients periodically because you don't have to do every six months echocardiogram, but whatever, every year, every other year, you may have to have a surveillance because down the road, there is a risk of PVC-induced cardiomyopathy. And, and in selected symptomatic patients, you can offer treatment in the terms of drugs. In a young person, you don't want to give drugs forever. Ablation is a reasonable option in a and, you know, success rate, uh, range from 60, 70, 80 percent. Um, so that's the end of my talk.